Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. I've got the sun shining in my face on a Friday afternoon. Uh, just had a very fascinating uh, conversation with uh, my guest today, Michael Gretz. He's the co-author of this new book, The Wolf at the Door, The Menace of Economic Insecurity and How to Fight It. And wow, we, there's so much to understand, not only about issues of economic insecurity and how more intensely than I think anyone could have imagined. Uh, so many millions of Americans are experiencing that in this time of pandemic. But what the connection is between the profound changes in our economy, say, since the end of World War II uh, to the time we, times we live in today and our politics of today and, and then working from the politics back to the economics issues what are some of the ways in which we really need to address the, the issue of uh, economic insecurity in order to move forward as a country? So uh, what a, a really great conversation. Um, I'm learning a lot reading the book, The Wolf at the Door. I know you will too. And you will uh, learn so much and enjoy this conversation with my guest, Michael Gretz, from my alma mater, Columbia University. Um, Everybody, please continue to stay safe. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, masks are the best weapon to protect yourself and to protect others. If we were to listen to the scientific authorities, and of course, I think we should. And also, again, uh, we're now uh, under 50 days until the election on November 3rd. I hope everyone will make a commitment to vote and will make your plans now as to how you're going to vote, make sure that your vote counts as all of us should be doing. Thank you. Stay tuned. Please enjoy this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. I want to welcome my guest today, Michael Gretz. Uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Michael? Yes. Okay. Michael is a professor of law at my alma mater, Columbia University, and also an emeritus professor at Yale Law School, and is the co-author, uh, along with Ian Shapiro of Yale, of a new book called The Wolf at the Door, The Menace of Economic in Insecurity and How to Fight It. And uh, uh, Michael, first of all, I, I imagine you were not thinking about a global pandemic and the resulting economic uh, devastation that that's brought about when, when you and Ian decided to write this book. Um, so the premise of the book which I'm going to ask you to tell us about, has to be that much more severe and acute given the conditions we're looking at today, now just a few weeks away from uh, a very important national election. But uh, get, maybe give us some background on yourself and, and how you came to write this book. And, and we'll start with the premise of the book, which is the, the central role of economic insecurity in understanding a lot of the politics of today. Sure. Well, I've been involved for a long time in, in issues of uh, tax policy and social insurance uh, policy, including health insurance and, and other uh, social security and unemployment insurance. And Ian Shapiro and I were teaching a class, um, both at Yale and Columbia, uh, for a number of years on uh, the politics of economic insecurity. We had... Uh, come to believe that the spotlight on the top 1%, which the Occupy movement and uh, others had really brought to light, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, likes to call them the millionaires and the billionaires, mm -hmm. um, had distracted us actually from focusing on the economic insecurities of the middle class and below. Um, and um, we were really uh, engaged in an effort to uh, at least share the spotlight, if not shift the spotlight from the very top uh, down to the real problems that are facing uh, Americans and their families. Now, of course, um, as you suggested in your question, when our book actually came out in February, not a good time, I would add, for publishing a book. All of our uh, 
book uh, events and so forth got canceled, needless right. to say. Right. Uh, but in February, when the book came out, the unemployment rate was the lowest in 50 years. And yet, according to the Federal Reserve, the average American, in fact, 44% of Americans, said that they could not pay off a $400 emergency with cash or with a credit card that they could pay off by the end of the month. And needless to say, the pandemic has had uh, two effects here. One is that it has uh, itself shifted the spotlight to some of the insecurities of uh, working Americans. And uh, it has also uh, created a situation where uh, the emergencies that people are confronting are far more than uh, $400. Uh, so we went from a situation where we had the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years to a situation a few months later where we had the highest unemployment rate in 90 years. Um, and so uh, we didn't foresee the pandemic. The insecurity of American workers and their families, the precariousness of their financial situations had actually become very clear to us uh, from having looked at it carefully before the pandemic. And now the pandemic has, has made it, as I said, very, very much worse. Um, and Congress, uh, I think it's fair to say, I'm sure we'll get into this in more detail, yeah. but Congress did not have a sound foundation to build upon in the event of a crisis. Um, just to take, I think, the most important example or one of the more important examples, the uh, system of unemployment insurance that we have uh, really doesn't cover uh, many workers. It doesn't cover independent contractors. It doesn't cover temporary and part-time workers. It doesn't cover freelancers. It, uh, uh, during the last uh, number of years before the pandemic, it was covering somewhere between a quarter and a third of unemployed workers. And for them, the benefits they were receiving was not enough to keep their heads above water. Um, many of them found themselves going into poverty. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that. And so Congress just had to make something up. Uh, and what it made up was pretty sound. And we can talk about that later. But uh, at this point, I just want to emphasize just how precarious the situation was for workers who faced uh, unexpected emergency. And the unexpected emergencies have just raged throughout the country as the pandemic has moved from the Northeast to the South and then to the West um, and the Midwest as, as it has. Well, right. And the other, I'm just listening to that. There's, I'm having so many thoughts, even just hearing your reference to workers, you know, there's probably some people that think anytime, you know, professor starts talking about protecting workers, you know, they're talking about almost, almost as if that's a reference to a labor movement, but, but which, it, which it may include for sure. But when you look back as you do in trying to understand where uh, not just workers in, in unions in those types of jobs, but really across the spectrum of the workforce, how things have changed, say, since the 1950s um, in the types of jobs, in the types of uh, incomes, in the types of benefits, in all the ways that employment led to security, and all the ways today that that has changed so dramatically. Um, exactly. Let me, let, me, let me say something yeah. about that. I, yeah, I, think, I, mean, I think this is really important because there are a lot of people who point to the period after the Second World War when U.S. economic growth was really robust and the benefits were widespread. And 
you know, one of the questions that we try and discuss in the book is how did we get from, from there to here? And the first point I think to make is that after the war, the U.S. had all the money there was. Right. The, uh, uh, you know, Europe was a shambles. Japan was a shambles. Uh, Russia was not interested in economic well-being, but rather in political and, and uh, um, he, you know, hegemony of, of communism. And, and China was entering into a dark communist period. And so we, we were really the world's dominant economic power. And in the mid 70s, uh, after the oil crisis, which was a huge um, disruption in American uh, economic life, um, we started getting a lot of imports of automobiles from Japan and Germany as they had recovered from steel, uh, of steel from Japan and Germany of textiles, uh, then largely from Japan, but not solely from Japan. And the manufacturing industry of the US really began to hollow out. I mean, we saw it very vividly in Youngstown, Ohio, where the mm -hmm. uh, steel plant closed. And uh, presidents ever since uh, have gone to Youngstown and promised to bring those steel jobs back and those steel jobs are not coming back. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, there are lots of reasons for that. I mean, the first one, which I just mentioned, is really the globalization of the economy. And of course, the entry of China into the world economy, which has been extremely important. Um, it is our view that, that the disruptions in the American job market from trade really peaked around 2009 or 2010 and that the larger threats to the job market going forward are from technology, um, where uh, technology is transforming the nature of work right. and really uh, threatening uh, the economic security of uh, people who have a high school education or a couple of years of college, uh, but not a college education. So the division has really uh, taken an important turn based on education as much as anything else. And um, the other point you mentioned was, was labor unions. And I think it's mm -hmm. very important to understand what happened to labor unions. Labor unions membership, private sector labor unions membership mm -hmm. peaked in the 1950s and then began to decline very significantly in the 1970s uh, as, as the country's manufacturing tended to move to the South and the Southwest uh, where you do not have the kinds of labor unions you had in the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, and that had not only economic consequences, uh, but we talk importantly about the political consequences it had because what it meant was that the US workers were really no longer represented by any collective organization in the political process, whether at the federal level or at the state level. Well, and that, that's a hugely important transformation of both economic and political power in the United States. Right, and, and that's where I wanna pause and make sure we kind of we understand what really why we're talking about this. One is that, uh, I mean, economic insecurity in itself, which gets at in wealth inequality, stagnating, uh, rise, wage increases, the the purchase power of of wages being so so much diminished, and a access to health insurance and other things that become very costly. So. All of those things contribute to the state we have today, and, and of course, inequalities in, in uh, uh, among racial groups, differences in between men and women in the workforce, and all, all of those issues are implicated. Um, and so, it's it's a it it there is a purpose in and of itself to understand and address issues of of economic insecurity, but. Clearly, you're also, as you just said, focusing on this issue as a way of understanding 
our political times. And I think for a lot of us looking at the politics of today, and I, th I think there are roots, as, as you point out, going back to, uh, to, to Richard Nixon's time in the 70s, and I, and I think as well, the coalition that Ronald Reagan put together in 1980 to win and, and bring a conservative based politics to a group of people that at least to the extent that it involved white so-called working class voters never made sense to, to many people. And then to today, Trump's appeal to this demographic we hear about anytime we're looking at poll results, which is white non-college educated Americans being solidly in, uh, or, or Trump having a solid advantage with that demographic though it seems to many observers, myself included, to be unexplainable given the conflict in interests that you would think why non-college educated workers would have looking at, looking at Donald Trump's policies, except when you then go through the background as you do to understand what the experience of these people has been and why and how they've come to feel so insecure and how that could so easily translate, you could then see to uh, other threats that they perceive, whether it's from immigration, whether it's from, as you point out, greater access of racial minorities and women into the workforce. Um, but I thought this was absolutely fascinating that manufacturing, the manufacturing sector accounted for 18.2 million jobs in 1974 and only 12 million in 2016, despite tremendous growth in our population. But this is even more telling, I think, is, which is the service sector part of our economy going from 40 million to 104 million. And what that suggests uh, in terms of economic uh, insecurity for people that were used to kind of those glory days of, of employment and, and economic power in, in the 1950s in this country. Exactly. I mean, one of the points that I keep making is that the clock doesn't run backwards and people would like to go back to the 1950s and we can't go back to the 1950s because the economy and the, and the political situation are, yeah. are just remarkably different. Um, you know, what we, what we discovered when we looked at the polling data and so forth from 2016 is exactly what, what you said, which is that Donald Trump was able to uh, play on the anger, fears, and resentment of a lot of uh, middle class voters. Um, I always fond of, of quoting in this context um, Tucker Carlson, who was, I always describe as Fox News bad boy, who said uh, Trump's election was not about Trump. It was a throbbing middle finger in the face of America's ruling class. It was a howl of rage. Happy countries don't elect Donald Trump, desperate ones do. So Tucker Carlson's not wrong about everything. <laughs> That's right. That rings very true, actually. Got that exactly right. Yeah. And 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 I think uh, people have underestimated the importance of this anger, fear, and resentment. And what Trump has done, as as you know well, is to villainize um, foreign goods and claim that protectionism is a solution. And we know from his tariffs that protectionism costs many more jobs than it creates. And what it costs the American consumer per job is enormous. So protectionism is not the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the um, immigration idea yeah. uh, is a reflection of a kind of, of xenophobia um, and concern particularly uh, as he has transformed the integration immigration issue into concern about um, residents coming in from the southern border rather than the northern border. That's not an accident. So he's 
vilifying uh, brown people and, and black people at the same time. Well, and he adds in people will come from the ghettos to the suburbs. That's, exactly. that's the latest incarnation. Exactly. And so it, it's the movement of, of minorities that he's, that he's demonizing. Right. And these are not solutions. These are, these are, these are uh, maybe electoral uh, successful moves that he is making. Um, and our book is really unusual because it's a book about politics and policy. You see a lot of books about politics and you see a few books about policy, but you rarely see a book about politics and policy together. But our book is about legislative politics and trying to get things done and to change. But we start from the rise of populism, both from the left and the right in America, both of which I think are reflections of the economic insecurity of a wide swath of the American uh, people and, and by implication their families. And, and um, I don't think you can underestimate the importance of this. And we've seen it elsewhere in the world, both in, in populism from the right and populism from the left. Uh, but I think that, you know, that this is why it's such an urgent matter, I think, to try and provide more security for these families so that uh, uh, something that we know is not going to work, but which stokes uh, and unleashes uh, political movements uh, on both sides that really divide the American public in ways that I've never seen in my lifetime. Are, uh, are, are less important uh, uh, or become more clear, become, become clearly about something other than economics. And I think that's not the case today. Well, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, uh, Michael, because of course there's so much focus on um, the presidential race in November and uh, uh, the president does a very good job of sucking up all the attention. I think that's one of the things that he's been very successful at doing, whether we, whether you like it or not. But there are other really important races in November that are going to have a tremendous impact on the direction our country takes. Um, the house the, the house seems to be fairly securely in the hands of of the Democrats right now. The Senate is really hanging in the balance, and it would be a, 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 a the. Republicans are, are very vulnerable, and there's a lot of sense that uh, that 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 uh, house could change hands uh, in November. How do I mean? It, there seem to be so many ways in which the rhetoric and the the statement about policy run against the interests of the groups that they're appealing to. Um, and, and let's not even get too deep into the issue of, uh, of, of what is truth anymore. Um, but, you know, the party that has campaigned for, for years and years now on, a, on repealing Obamacare, for example, but has, no, has never put forth another plan. I mean, you would think that people who, as you say, are $400 away from... Uh, you know, being insolvent in their personal finances, or as, or as Bernie Sanders would often say, you know, one paycheck away from personal bankruptcy or one ER visit away from personal bankruptcy. You would think that if, if people were thinking in their interests, that the rhetoric of small government and fiscal responsibility and all of that would just simply be shattered when, when you'd look closely at even just one example, say on, on healthcare. How do you think some of what you look at in, in terms of the, pol the, the changing economic status of the American worker and uh, uh, in particular of this block of, of, of white voters that doesn't seem historically to actually vote in its own interest economically how do you see that playing out in 
in so-called down ballot races, you know, leaving aside the, the, the higher drama and higher um, profile of the presidential race. Well, the, the Senate is, is really very, very close, and it's going to take quite a bit for even a 50-50 split in the Senate, at least the way I read the polls these days. And, and one should not uh, overlook the legislatures in the states and, and, mm -hmm. and the city uh, governments, which have been very important in, in trying to address some of these issues as, as we've seen. And, and you know, the small government uh, movement is, is itself uh, now 40, 40 years old or, or more, 45. And the virus has shown us how much uh, we need a safety net. Mm -hmm. uh, that is supplied by government. Uh, just to take your health insurance example, which I think is an important one. And it's interesting because by focusing on legislative politics, we are very well aware of the incrementalism of the American political system, which was by design, both in its federalist uh, aspects, but also in the composition of the House and the Senate. And um, we have in the book uh, what we call six building blocks of effective uh, distrib distributive legislative politics. And one of those uh, building blocks, or two, let me mention two, is to uh, pursue proximate goals and to try and entrench those goals going forward. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, we've been criticized uh, from the left, particularly for not being uh, um, more optimistic, for not having more vision about that. Uh, Bob Greenstein, who is the head of the Center of Policy, policy and Budget Prior Budget and Policy oh Priorities, God. and in, in fact, the most effective advocate over the last several decades for the poor, puts it quite well. He says that when the forces line up, you need to take two steps forward and when the uh, pendulum swings the other way, only go a half a step backwards. And uh, we have a very specific proposal for health care that really takes this into account. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. That is that um, um, it's clear that, that employer-based health care, which is really almost unique to the United States, it, it, there are one or two other countries that have done some of that, but they've gotten away from it. Um, the pandemic makes it absolutely clear that relying on employers, not only for your wage, but also for your health care, uh, just increases mammothly the risks that employees are facing. Um, and so uh, we have actually uh, suggested uh, what we call Medicare from the bottom up which is to allow uh, people under age 35 to elect into Medicare. That has the advantage of uh, creating a mix of Medicare recipients who are both young and old and therefore mm -hmm. changes the risk pool rather dramatically. And, um, and then raising those ages uh, incrementally over time so that it becomes a lot like a public option of the sort that Obamacare was intended to have, but which actually a Democratic senator, Joe Lieberman, uh, blocked because of his relationship with the insurance industry, the health insurance industry, which was largely but not only in Connecticut. So even if you had a 50-50 or 51-49 split in the Senate, the power of any one senator in those circumstances is 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 not something to overlook, yeah. and uh, and Obama was really beaten on the public option by by a Democrat in in that context, and so and saved, and saved by a Republican. I mean, John McCain's vote when it counted again shows the tremendous influence that even one Senate vote can have. Exactly, and, and and the repeal of Obamacare was really saved by McCain's thumbs up or thumbs down at the, at the two o'clock in the morning on the on the Senate floor, and so this shows you just how how precarious 
uh, yeah. making good policy and and entrenching uh, victories for the future going forward is now you know a public option is, is another way to get to the same place that we're we're talking about and and biden has proposed that so there are alternative paths but you do have to think about these these issues and 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 again on the politics of this our book really emphasizes the role of coalitions and the need to protect against blocking coalitions and so it's coalitional politics and the legislature that are so important to getting to getting something done and uh, and and so i think that you know elections are obviously terribly important and this one is particularly important but um, you know, the, the, the Senate is not going to change dramatically, even if it changes importantly. Well, it seems like, I mean, the idea, and I, I agree with, in principle, with the idea of coalitions as the best way to achieve anything practically. I mean, unless you're on one extreme or the other and you're advocating some, some variation of revolution and, you know, tear it down and rebuild it in some way. Um, but it seems more and more like the idea of any kind of coalition is 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 just uh, um, you know as as nostalgic and sentimental as my uh, it's a wonderful life um, you know, the old Jimmy Stewart movie so how do you, how uh, you know and Biden you know Biden tried to even to wax nostalgic about working with senators on the other side and made the terrible mistake. And I think it was actually Kamala Harris who gave him a hard time about it. You know, dared to remember when he actually got something done working with Strom Thurmond. You know, so, so how do you see that in a time when we all come to say, as if it's just the truth, that we are more entrenched in our opposite political polls than, than we've ever been? How, how do we get past that? to actually oh, I, effectuate coalition building. You know, I'm, I'm hoping, particularly given the number of Republicans that have now supported uh, Joe Biden's candidacy and the likelihood he'll put at least one or two Republicans in his cabinet, I think, that, that, that maybe we can get by it. But it is the case that, that Congress is just much more partisan than it ever has been. And if you look at the parties, there's much less ideological overlap these days than there than there was in the past, and so it's much harder to do. Mm -hmm. And we've seen two important instances of of rather large changes that have been done on a partisan basis. Um, one is Obamacare, where um, it was done virtually entirely with with Democrats, and uh, the Trump tax cuts, which were done entirely mm -hmm. with with Republican votes, only Republican votes, and. And those kinds of, of policies tend not to be very stable. Um, if you look at stable changes in American policy, uh, even recently they have been bipartisan in nature. Mm -hmm. Look at the CARES Act um, and, the, and the pandemic response. Those votes were heavily um, positive votes on both sides of the aisle and the right. negotiations that have been necessary. Now, at the moment, we're seeing a stalemate because one side won't come over and agree with the other. But um, I'm not I'm not prepared yet uh, to give up on the idea that that the American political system can make changes in a in a way that 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 is bipartisan in some sense. Um, I do think, and we talk about this in the book, and I think this is a real issue. And I it's I, I've been frustrated actually by. Uh, the inability to rally people around this idea, but we were encouraged just about the time the book was, was being written with the statement of the Business Roundtable in, in August of, of 2019 uh, that uh, corporate purpose was no longer solely directed at benefiting their shareholders, but was also importantly uh, directed at benefiting their employees and their communities. And uh, given what's going on uh, with the demise or what's happened with the demise of the labor unions in the United States, businesses have got enormous sway, both large businesses and small businesses, 
in the political process. And we have really been trying to rally uh, some members of the business community, including uh, some who talk a very good game like Jamie Dimon and, and others, um, into, into really uh, thinking hard about how to create, for example, an unemployment system that would, that would work mm -hmm. for them. Uh, because the unemployment system we now have really is not uh, business friendly at all um, and doesn't protect their workers. And so I think there is, you know, I think if you think creatively about it, there are yeah. po possible coalitions. We talk yeah. about infrastructure yeah. and, the, and, the, and the ability to put together a rural and urban coalition to build roads, repair trains and, and bridges, and also rural broadband and the like, and to create uh, public-private partnerships that will engage uh, both the public sector and the private sector in, in, in creating jobs and, you know, and improving the, the country's ability to respond going forward. Well, I, I know there's some good examples of what you're talking about uh, in the area of environmental uh, change, my environmental progress, companies including very large companies. And we did a whole episode on this uh, with a couple of um, profs from, from uh, Vanderbilt. Um, if you wait around for the government to get together enough so, so that they, we can actually move forward on climate change, for example, I mean, we're all gonna be either drowned or fried somewhere on the planet, but that private industry can actually, and has already, in fact, made a lot of progress in reducing carbon, enacting um, uh, other measures to, uh, to reduce, you know, the carbon footprint that, they're, that they have. Uh, Amazon is now advertising, you see these on television about how they have a commitment to go uh, carbon neutral in uh, I think the next 10 years and all the different. So they're using these things in, in to promote themselves, but they're also, do actually doing a lot of uh, engaging in a lot of very strong moves in, in the right direction, it seems. Are there, are there other sectors where you're also seeing that or maybe private smaller government or state local government partnerships say, in, in infrastructure and other important uh, parts of our economy? Well, there have been some very positive examples on the infrastructure side of public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, just to take one I'm quite familiar with is LaGuardia Airport, mm -hmm. which was uh, um, actually in the words of Joe Biden, a, an airport for a third world country. When you landed at LaGuardia, you thought you had entered into, a, into a, a, an undeveloped country yeah. or a less developed country. And uh, um, there, um, through creative financing of a public-private partnership. Uh, there were many jobs that were created. The thought, of course, the airline industry has been badly hit by the pandemic, but the thought is that it would create um, many jobs going forward, not just the construction jobs that were connected to the, to the airport. There are other examples, the Denver light rail uh, system, which was really done by a coalition of, of the, air, of the uh, counties around Denver um, and the rail system that now goes into downtown Denver from the Denver airport is another good example where uh, um, it's led to urban development and uh, revitalization of a downtown area of Denver that had been under a great siege. And so there, there are areas uh, for this, but I, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact, and I think it's an important fact that the kinds of problems that we're really talking about, which are problems of creating jobs, making work pay better, uh, providing a path from unemployment to reemployment, these are responsibilities of governments. Um, and they're not something that a private insurance market or a private um, attention to uh, providing a little child care here for your employees or not, which although they're beneficial, um, those are not, not going to be solutions. And I, I also think it's important that there have been some 
other developments in the red states that have been extremely important. Uh, one of the examples that we talk about a lot in the book is the move to universal pre-K uh, education, yeah. which has been, uh, you know, if you're in the urban corridor, you think about uh, cities like Washington, D.C. and Boston and New York that have been successful. Uh, but if you look at the report of the evaluating group on uh, universal pre-K, they give very high marks to Alabama's system. Uh, Oklahoma was one of the early uh, universal pre-K uh, systems. And so I think there are ways uh, that we really do cross political boundaries. And if we just retreat to the uh, uh, corners of, of the left and the right, uh, then I think I think it is going to be very hard to get anything done, and you know we've seen that. I mean the 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 situation at the moment where Congress is has really let uh, unemployed workers uh, down in a way that was uh, almost unimaginable a, a couple of months ago that 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 the unemployment would run out and and Congress wouldn't extend it. Um, you know, even when the president has tried to remove some money uh, from uh, other emergencies to, to, to help fund a little unemployment compensation during the, a bridge period. So I think, I think there are opportunities that you, one has to be creative and, and one has to really think about structure so that if you make these changes, they are, um, they are robust for the future. I mean, again, if you if you take unemployment insurance, so Franklin Roosevelt knew and said what we needed is a national program of, of unemployment insurance. But at the time, he was very afraid that the attitude of the Supreme Court about national economic programs was such that it would strike down as unconstitutional a national program of, of unemployment insurance. Now that's an archaic view today, but he created a state-based system and we've seen a huge rush to the bottom uh, among the states so that they try and spend as little as they can, mm -hmm. try and tax their businesses as little as possible. And you get a state like Florida which is covering 11% of unemployed workers and not giving them uh, benefits that keep them out of poverty. Um, so, uh, uh, so we need to move from a, from a, from a state-based system to a national system. And there are no constitutional constraints on, on that these, these days. Um, and we just need to think, I think, creatively about how to create coalitions that will, uh, including uh, business in the coalition, uh, because it's very hard to do anything with unified opposition of, of large and small businesses in, in any legislature in America today. Well, it does. So, so that does bring us back to Congress. And, and uh, it does. I mean, you can just see it when you think back on the last two administrations, where most of the legislating has been done by executive order. And then you have a change in administration and the next president just says, on my first day, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of all those executive orders. So you can, you can see just from that how uh, unstable or uh, insecure are, are those types of ways of making change in policy. So if, it's, if it really needs to come from Congress and it really needs to come in a, in a more bipartisan coalition focused way. And it really needs to be to tackle some of the deeper issues of economic insecurity. It really does need to come from the federal level and not be left only to the states and, and to the private sector. Whether it's Trump or uh, reelected or Biden elected to replace him, I mean, what, what are the, you know, what are, would you say are on the top of your list of the things that you think the that we hope we think about hopefully that those future coalitions starting next year would would direct their attention to um i i want to answer that question but but i also don't want to leave the states out of out of this story yeah. because um you know the the blueprint for obamacare was was massachusetts's 
of Romney here, although Romney himself denied it, as you remember. Oh God, uh, California has been extremely important on environmental issues and energy uh, related issues and so forth. So, so there are state examples. The minimum wage, for example, has been done at the been raised at the local level and at the state level throughout the country. So it's not just the federal level, although there are some things like unemployment insurance and health care where the role of the federal government, I think, is extremely important and even essential. Um, so we have we have really uh, one focus in our book, and that is uh, really um, making um, work um, more economically secure. And that requires creating jobs and, and we really do look to infrastructure with both which both Democrats and Republicans support they may support different projects but they both support infrastructure and debt finance of infrastructure is really quite common in both the states and the cities and and in the federal government and uh, quite appropriate when the interest rate is is close to zero so so we think that's that's a, a a major opportunity for creating jobs. Um, again, so that's, Roosevelt, how, that's how we got out of the depression. Roosevelt, yeah. If you look at the numbers of parks, roads, yeah. bridges, and so forth that were created during the depression, um, it was it, it was enormous. And and we can't do anything at that scale, but we can do quite a lot. And we certainly need it because American Society of Civil Engineers gives us a D plus, I think, at the moment on on our infrastructure in America. So we look to that for creating jobs. We look, we have a chapter actually that talks about the universal basic income, the earned income tax credit, and minimum wages for making uh, uh, work pay better and, and for mm -hmm. lifting boats. And we conclude for a lot of reasons that the earned income tax credit, which has been very successful. And again, here's a good example. The federal government created the earned income tax credit, created it in the 1970s on a, on a, in a democratic uh, uh, way, but with a Republican president. Um, it was then added to by George Herbert Walker Bush, by Bill Clinton. It's grown over the years. So it's now very, very important for workers with children. It, it's not successful for single workers. Mm -hmm. And the states have been able to piggyback on it. So that states all around the country, red and blue states, have got their own state earned income tax credits that that make work pay better for for uh, low and moderate income workers. Um, and then we we have a chapter uh, which I think is extremely important and become more important because of the pandemic uh, called from unemployment to reemployment. And in that chapter, we 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 would take the unemployment insurance system, which is broken for many of the reasons I've mentioned. I'll just give you one more example of a way it's broken. If you look at Google, Google has 120,000 independent contractors working side by side with 100,000 employees. And when Google lays off its employees, they're eligible for unemployment compensation. But when it lays off its independent contractors, they're not. And so it's, 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 it's hugely important given the growth of independent contractors in the economy uh, in recent years. But we would take unemployment insurance and then we would marry that with a, a variation on what was called trade adjustment assistance. And so um, when John F. Kennedy was president and he was looking to liberalize trade, he created a program called trade adjustment assistance which if you lost your job due to trade, due to, due to imports basically, then you were entitled to retraining and relocation assistance and, and all of the kinds of help that um, we need in, in the current economy. The problem with trade adjustment assistance was twofold. One was it became very difficult to show that their job loss was due to trade. Right. That it was due to imports, which you had to do. And then Lyndon Johnson lost interest in it. He had other other interests. And so not one trade adjustment assistance request was approved from uh, 1962 to 1969. Yeah. 
Um, and then uh, Jimmy Carter uh, refused to expand it. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, cut it back. Uh, Clinton tried to expand it when he passed NAFTA, but it didn't work. And so we have a program which combines unemployment insurance and the principles of, of trade adjustment assistance into something we call universal adjustment assistance, which essentially protects workers when they're unemployed and creates a mechanism for retraining and, and uh, relocation of workers who need to uh, up, upgrade their skills or, or actually move to a different location to get the kinds of jobs they need. Um, and, and this is the kind of program that, that I think anybody can get behind. You don't have to be a Democrat or Republican. It, it is, uh, you know, it's not an easy lift uh, but it's something that can be done. It can actually be done in stages. And it is something that everybody realizes is important uh, these days. I mean, you can, you know, you have these presidents who go to Youngstown and they say, we're going to bring back the steel factories. But if you look at the best, uh, one of the best steel factories in Youngstown today, it's making rolled steel for pipelines. It's got 300 workers, they're, they're making close to $100,000 a year each. Um, and then it's full of robots mm -hmm. and uh, technology. And, and, you know, so you create, you know, three more of those and, and you have 900 more workers employed. Um, and you compare it to a place like Allentown, Pennsylvania, which was the same kind of steel town. And they realized that they had to change by moving from, uh, steel production into education and healthcare and technology. Yeah. Uh, you look at Hickory, North Carolina. Hickory, North Carolina was devastated by uh, Chinese imports because it was a furniture manufacturing capital of the country. And they moved to making custom uh, upholstery. Um, they uh, got some tech uh, companies to come to Hickory. Uh, they've uh, really had important leadership at the local level that's, that's made a huge difference in, in what they're doing. But the, but the technology disruption of jobs is another thing that the pandemic, I think, is, is accelerating. People have learned uh, the, the ability to work from home. They've, they've learned the ability to do things uh, uh, virtually, uh, yep. as we are now doing, that couldn't be done. It's totally uh, transformed my world in, in the legal, uh, in, in, in the practice of law and litigation. I mean, I haven't been inside a courtroom, I've only been inside a courtroom once since March. Exactly. But we continue to exactly. move our cases. We're filing, we're moving, we'll soon have trials figured out. It won't take that much longer. Exactly. My yeah. spouse argued a Second Circuit case over the telephone uh, during the right. pandemic. So, right. uh, so, so, so these are these are happening, and I think that the technology revolution is really a one-way conveyor belt. I don't think we're going back in time on that either, and that makes uh, a program like the Universal Adjustment Assistance more important. Uh, than ever in terms of, of moving us forward. Workers have to become more nimble um, and, and more uh, able to change uh, jobs. And, and, and the community colleges, which we enlist in this effort mm -hmm. for training and retraining, have been extremely successful in training people for jobs that exist um, unlike some of the universities, including my own, that are training people to argue about philosophical issues that have not right. been resolved for hundreds of years. Um, so, I mean, I'm a great believer in, in, in liberal arts education and so forth, but I think we also have to really enlist some of these institutions uh, like the community colleges uh, and some of the state uh, universities that have been so effective in, in, in creating a pipeline to, to jobs for people who otherwise wouldn't have gone to college. Well, we started talking about the, the disconnect between the, all the changes that um, we've seen in, in the economy in 
and its impact on different demographic groups and uh, particularly curious the 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 attitudes of uh, of white workers especially uh, those without college degrees who once dominated our economy the time after World War II and now feel all these threats to their to their already diminished status uh, from and the, and the ways in which politically that's been exploited. Um, it, Trump was asked at a town hall this week by someone who I think asked the question uh, we all wish had been asked before, which is, uh, when was America so, when was America great that you're trying to take us back to? From, you know, the slogan, make America great again. Where's, where are you trying to get us back to? And it's obvious when you read the first chapter of your book, what, what he's playing to, the, the insecurities he's playing to, um, may, may be only remarkable in how overt he is in, in the references to, uh, you know, to race and immigrants and, and women and uh, so, many, so many other ways that he's exploiting those fears. But there's, as you pointed out, when we started this conversation and try to wrap up on the same note, we're not going back. And it does seem like the only way, if you are uh, not just someone looking at the pictures as you and I are talking about it from, from way up here on down, but if you're an individual out there feeling the effects in your life and with your family of the economic ins insecurity and the, the things that you'd like to see your state and federal representatives do, you, 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 would, you would think that you have to think in terms of looking forward and not looking back to some rosy time that you imagine existed uh, even if it only existed for some in this country, not for others. So how, are you hopeful about that? I guess is what I want to try to see what, you know, as you've gone through all this and, and, and I will, we will put a uh, link to the book. And, and uh, as I said, I, I think it's really important. It's timely. And uh, I think you'll have a much deeper understanding of where we are, not only in terms of economic policy, but but in our politics of today. I think the book really covers all that. We'll put a link in, in the description so people can get the book, Michael. But uh, I mean, when you look ahead, there's a lot of fear and anxiety right now in the country. Tremendous, uh, whether it's because of the public health crisis, the economic crisis, if you see it this way, and I certainly do, the political crisis that we're in the, in the midst of, and Maybe, maybe that's going to get worse in a few weeks' time. What, what do you see around the next corner that, that you're most hopeful about that, that you think can, can actually lead to some positive changes in, in uh, the areas we're talking about? Well, I, I'm, I am an optimist uh, by nature. I, I've, I've been that way my whole life, and so I can't give it up uh, just, okay. just because times are, are dark at the moment in all sorts of ways. I do think one of the points that we really make in our book, and I think it's, it's, it's really important and overlooked by people, is that the behavioral economics literature has really demonstrated over a long period of time that people are really much more uh, concerned with the potential of loss than they are with, the, with, with gain. Mm. Um, there are good examples in the book. There's a Dutch ethnologist who did a, a experiment with capuchin monkeys, which I recommend to anybody about uh, where he started giving two monkeys each cucumbers uh, and the assistant then started giving the monkey next door grapes. And soon the monkey who was getting only cucumbers refused to do the task and started throwing the cucumbers back at the assistant. And, and it's really, it's really a perfect example yeah. about how people make local comparisons. That is to say, you, you look at your neighbors, you look at the coworkers, you look at people around you. I'm always uh, fond of saying that, that my colleagues in, in the law faculty will care a lot more that somebody, uh, next door has just gotten a $10,000 raise that they didn't get 
then they care about the five million or ten million or dollars that the investment bankers or the lawyers in in, in town are uh, are making, and and so I think it's important to to uh, um, to realize that that Donald Trump never said anything about inequality. He bragged about being a billionaire. What he what he focused on through immigration, through xenophobia, through Make America Great Again, which of course he stole from Ronald Reagan, but but that's a minor point. Um, you know, he 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 really f uh, focused on um, playing on the insecurities of, uh, of of the American public and blaming it on others. Yeah, and has and has never made any real effort to do anything about it. I mean, you know, he he talks about his health care plan, for example, but he's never had a health care plan that we know of. If he had one, maybe he'd tell us about it. So, um, you know, it, it it's it's uh, very difficult uh, with the way, as you pointed out, media is divided and people get their information and so forth. Uh, but I do think that that the pandemic. Uh, frankly, has has really uh, shifted the attention to the people who are in the most precarious jobs and are just one virus away mm -hmm. from from destitution. And you know, uh, our goal was to help shift the spotlight. We we're not happy that the pandemic came, obviously, to to do that. Uh, but I do think that with adversity of this sort with a crisis of this sort, there, there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw Congress just make up a, a unemployment insurance, a national unemployment insurance system out of whole cloth. The, the mistake they made was that um, they ended it on July 31st instead of really thinking a little long-term. Well, I think, so, I'm sure they thought that that would be enough time and- I'm, I'm sure they, they did, and now they, they can't did, seem yeah. to do anything. But, right. but I, I'm optimistic that 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 we were, we will not be here um, in this kind of situation forever. Um, the American people have long been resilient, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and good I'm things a, have come out of at, at dark times. I mean, well, sure. I mean, all all, all all of the things we've talked about came out of the depression and yeah. and and the and the Second World War, which mm -hmm. created this burst of economic growth. And mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm, I'm not anxious for another depression or another world war. I think we really have to think creatively about how to get these things done politically and how to get them done in in the legislature. I mean, it takes legislation. It's not just an election. Right. Uh, you can't win an election and then say, you know, I've got plenty of time. I think Barack Obama made that mistake when he, when he had a Democratic uh, Congress the first two years and and then found himself stymied uh, after that. Yeah. So I think you have to be alert to the opportunities. And, and in some ways, you have to have an inventory of ideas to build upon. And that's really what we were hoping to accomplish in our book. Well, I hope everyone will take a look at the book, The Wolf at the Door, The Menace of Economic Insecurity and How to Fight It. Uh, Co-author, my guest on today's episode, Michael Gretz and his co-author, Ian Shapiro, who teaches uh, political science at Yale. Uh, we'll put a description, we'll put a, a link to the book in the description for the episode, which we will have uh, up as soon as we can. And I wanna thank you very much. What a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm learning a lot uh, reading the book and uh, making connections to all kinds of things I've been thinking about a lot. Um, which I think what is something everyone will will get out of the book and hopefully out of this conversation too. So thank I you so, so much again. Enjoy. Yeah, thank you for having me, Aaron.